The year was 2014. I was invited at a, um, a summer school uh, on the island of Elba where Napoleon got banned from his native country. And uh, that's where I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Martin Odersky, professor at the EPFL, a famous name in the programming languages community, inventor of the Scala programming language, founder of Typescale, now Lightband, because they thought Typescale is too geeky a name. Typesafe, sorry, Typesafe, Lightband, too many names. So, um, and most of all, a, a, a great, a great fellow and a good friend. Give a hand to Martin. Yeah, staying with this type, type safe, that's something that we programmers know, but nobody else knows. So when the first article came out in a business magazine, I think it was Forbes on the day we launched the company, actually they misspelled the name to typeface. So we were the typeface company. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it shows you something that, uh, uh, well, uh, don't, it's different communities have different names. So I want to talk about context, uh, how to abstract over context, which I have come to see as something that is really very, very important uh, because it's really something fundamental and all around us. So what is context? Well, the name, what the name says, it's what comes with con, Latin, with the text, but that's not in the text. So it's what you need to understand to uh, together with the text in order to understand the text. And the text in our case is usually a program. So context really is all around us. Uh, for instance, when you run a program, then implicitly you rely on the current configuration. It doesn't, it's not part of your program, but it will influence what your program does. Uh, furthermore, the current scope, so where does your program execute, is important. Uh, if you want to find out the meaning of, let's say, uh, the operation less on this type, then that's often not at all uh, directly clear. It could be inherited from somewhere, or in some languages there's a type class construct where this thing gets imported somewhere, or other languages have extension methods that does exactly, basically the same thing. So what even a simple thing like A less than B means is very, very context dependent usually. Uh, then you can scale this up and say, well, in some systems where maybe security or privacy matters, it's important what user has essentially started an operation. So the user on, which, on behalf of which an operation is performed is an important part of the context because that might influence the permissions of your programs, the security level in effect, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of things that are contexts, and uh, there are a lot of solutions out there uh, which I would often classify as ad hoc. So what solutions are there? So when our programs were small, uh, things were super easy. Uh, the context was simply the program, the global, essentially all the global variables in your program. So everything was understood in relation to that. Now, the problem is as systems grow, this we outgrow this possibility because it means that if you do that, then essentially everything can see everything. It's really hard to test because essentially you, want, you can't create mock instances. Uh, it's really hard to have separate instances of your program that do slightly different things and so on. So globals, I think we all have realized globals, they are essentially bad because when they're, in particular when they're mutable, they're very unsafe. And when they're immutable, then the problem is, well, a global constant, there's nothing bad about that, but it's very rigid. You can't change it, for, for instance, for testing purposes or configuration purposes and so on. And so, on. so that's why essentially globals, we have outgrown them. We need more. Uh, so then what came then was monkey patching, which was essentially something truly abhorrent that uh, people in dynamic languages, they started to essentially patch the uh, God class object uh, from which everybody inherits. So essentially they would just tweak little things in objects and add methods to it and, and so on. And that way, that was essentially another way to talk about global scope because essentially object is global. Everybody inherits from object in an object oriented language, but it was tweakable. It was mutable because these things you could override uh, in some classes. But it was, I mean, uh, if you uh, 
Uh, that was essentially the main style in, for instance, Rails, the framework for Ruby. But I believe by now, 10 years later, we realize that people have regretted this a lot. I mean, many uh, programmers' months were, were lost by chasing down some weird things that happened to be the result of some weird person monkey patching something that they shouldn't have touched. Uh, in Java land, uh, we have uh, something more uh, uh, systematic uh, and heavy that's uh, called dependency injection. So who here has already used the framework like Spring or Juice? Okay, quite a few of those, you, so you know what I'm talking about. So they do the job, essentially you can essentially add dependencies to programs in a dynamic way. It relies a lot on reflection. It's very hard to debug because a lot of it essentially happens behind your back and you don't really know what the dependency framework did with your program. But it's better than monkey patching. Uh, Scala has uh, developed its own more or less compile time version of a dependency injection called the cake pattern, which is uh, useful in some circumstances, but I don't really want to talk about it because I think it has, it has been superseded by what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so that's the traditional ways to do context. Oh, I forgot, there, there's, a, there's another one, like with privacy, there are these security managers, which essentially sit on top of the stack, and then when you want to do an operation, you do a stack scan, you go up the stack, and then the security manager decides whether you can do this operation or not. So that's yet another one. So you see there's a lot of essentially fairly ad hoc things, which all have to do about this thing, while well, the program runs in a context, and I somehow have to tweak things depending on the context I run in, uh, but there's no unique, un single canonical way to do that. <clears throat> now, I'm, uh, most of the time I'm a functional programmer. I also like imperative programming, but uh, uh, I like the combination of both. So with my functional programmer's hat on, I would say, well, it's really easy. In functional programming, you simply parameterize. Parameterize all the things. So it means, okay, if you need a context, then the context, uh, the thing in the context gets passed to the function as a parameter. You need a configuration, pass the configuration. You need a security level, pass the security level. You need uh, to know what uh, the less than operation means, pass a dictionary which defines the operation, and so on. So this is great for several reasons. <clears throat> there are no side effects. It's completely type safe, as long as your language is typed. Essentially, all these parameters are subject to the type, type discipline. <clears throat> and it gives you really fine-grained control. You can control precisely what you pass to what, and essentially all the overridings are under your control. <clears throat> but sometimes <clears throat> it can be too much of a good thing. Uh, <laughs> So <clears throat> with all these parameters, you end up with a huge number of them, 20, 30. Uh, you have a sea of parameters. And most of these hardly ever change. So you get 10 permissions from 10 different places, and you pass nine of them on to the next method that needs the nine, the nine permissions, and so on. So you essentially, a lot of the your programming surface then becomes just wiring. You know, essentially get these things, you push it out down, down there, it's very repetitive, it's boring. It's also prone to mistakes because, well, if it's repetitive, you don't tend to look very hard, and it's easy to just essentially take the wrong permission or take, take the wrong context thing or swap to and, and so on. So uh, that's not really a solution either. And essentially all we're up to is this problem to say it should be really easy, just pass a parameter, but there are too many of them. So we need to find more specialized solutions to do that. So couldn't there be a more direct approach? Just try to attack the problem at the root. So if passing a lot of parameters gets tedious, could we just leave some of them implicit? And I'll have to explain what that means. So what that means is uh, essentially what we will see is that we are, do by doing that, we are trading types for terms. So we have a parameter type, and I say, I need, let's say, an execution context, which is a thing that essentially wraps a scheduler for concurrent execution or whatever. And, um, but I don't e pass the execution context explicitly. Instead of the compiler, we'll look in the environment of the call, find, hopefully, the right execution context, and pass it on. So what we've done here, we passed, essentially, the type. I need an execution context. I have to be explicit about that for the term, which says, well, here's an execution context. Let me give you that. And in a sense, that's good, because types are specifications whereas terms are implementations, 
and uh, we have just raised the level of abstraction from an implementation to the specification. So we don't say, well, essentially, here's how you do it. We just say, that's what I need, and it's for you, the compiler, to figure out what that is. <coughs> so I believe that is sort of by accident uh, the, the essence of Scala. It wasn't designed that way, but it has evolved over time to that this is really the core of Scala. So what Scala is, uh, I, I would say it's really, it tried to do from the beginning a fusion of functional programming and object-oriented programming. The thesis is that essentially there is no conflict between the two, uh, that uh, in, in, uh, quite to the contrary, that at the intersection of functions and objects you can do a lot of very interesting things in a statically typed setting. So that was always like that. If you look at dynamically typed languages, then there are several others that have attempted this fusion and succeeded in part. Uh, for instance, Common Lisp or Smalltalk, so both of them one is more functional, the other more object-oriented, but both have a lot from the other side. And uh, the, what, what was missing to do the same thing in, in a statically typed setting. So it's a synthesis of these things. But now the funny thing is synthesis actually has several meanings of the word. And one word is, of course, program generation. We synthesize code. And it turns out that by now, Scala also do, does a lot of that. I would say probably uh, a large part of the synthesized code in the world is probably either D like metaprogramming and C++ like metaprogramming or a Scala implicit code generation. So essentially we have different approaches to the same, to the same uh, area here. So synthesis in Scala is implicit. So in this talk, I'm going to show you a large range of use cases where implicits can be applied, uh, show you a national generalization that we uh, have uh, recently added to Scala, well, it will be out in the next major version, implicit function types, and it argues that these constructs are the right way to abstract over context. Okay, so I have to explain to you what implicits are. Um, maybe let's start with a simple example, uh, just to that those of you who have never seen them see what this is. So here we have uh, a method send message, and it takes two parameters, a message, and then it takes an execution context, because we assume that we are in a concurrent setting and this thing has to be scheduled, and so we need an execution context to do that. Okay. But it's tedious to pass an execution context to everything, because normally it's always the same. So I pick one at the root of my program, and th that's it. But I don't want to pick, I don't want to commit to a single one for the whole world, because uh, some people need essentially a different schedule or things like that, so I want to keep that possibility open. So a typical use case for an implicit parameter. So somewhere, typically not right next to it, but maybe with an import, uh, I have an execution context, uh, which is uh, marked as an implicit. <coughs> and then I have an operation send message. And the, the idea now is that this send message will be uh, completed by the compiler to send message my context. So this my context will be filled in. Why? Because, well, it demands an execution context as an implicit parameter, and it has somewhere an implicit import uh, that uh, matches the type. So I fill in the term with the type. So that's what implicit parameters do in a nutshell. And if you look at the rules, so the ground rules are if you do not give an argument to an implicit parameter, one will be provided for you. Uh, eligible are in all implicit values that are visible at the point of call, so typically that uh, are uh, vis made visible by inheritance or import or definition in the same scope. Uh, and if there's more than one eligible candidate, the most specific one will be chosen. Specific is basically the same rules as for overloading resolution. So essentially, you take the most specific types, and if you find one which is most specific, then that's good. And if there's no unique most specific candidate, then you get an ambiguity. So if there's doubt which is the right imp implicit, the compiler doesn't try to give you one at random, but it uh, essentially raises an error and say, well, you have to be explicit here. Okay, so that's the rules, and um, uh, the, uh, if you look at what people do with implicits, then at least in the Scala ecosystem, they're really ubiquitous, so we have something like 95% of all projects in a large list of projects uh, are, uh, make some use of implicits, uh, only 5% don't, don't use them, and it's pretty uh, uniformly distributed how they use them. So essentially all aspects of implicits are used a lot. So it's not just me 
uh, waxing over how, 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 for, how powerful they are. People really make use of them, sometimes too much, actually. So I, I'll get to that. <coughs> so what people generally use too much, unfortunately, is uh, a cousin of implicit parameters called implicit conversions. So implicit conversions are very <coughs> similar to implicit parameters. The rules here are to say, well, let's say the type of A, if you have an expression, and it has a type, and there's an expected type, what it should be, and the two types don't match up. Then if, the, if there's an implicit conversion, so a, a function from A to B that is marked as an implicit, the compiler will pick that and essentially insert it to make an A, a B. And the same rules as for implicit parameters apply in, in terms of what is visible and what is more specific and, and things like that. So, historically, actually, that's why I said implicit parameters are sort of an accident. Uh, historically, we didn't have implicit parameters. We had implicit conversions from day one in Scala. And the reason we had them was that in object-oriented languages, there's this vexing problem where you say you have a class and it can extend other classes. But what if you invent a new class, abstract class or interface, and say an existing class should inherit that? So you have to go back to the existing class and add that new interface. But maybe, <clears throat> maybe that's not your code. You are not allowed to touch it. Right? So there's, there's this problem that you can't essentially implement new interfaces with existing classes. And implicit conversions were meant as a simple way to do that, to say, well, if I can't directly implement that interface, at least I can convert to it. I can have a, basically a simple wrapper that essentially gives you that interface, and that's basically all we can do, and it's quite useful for, for these things. Um, so these con implicit conversions, they are very simple to understand, to say, well, I essentially want, to, I have a string which represents a number, say, I want an int, uh, I don't really want to write string dot value of, uh, sorry, int dot, string dot parse int uh, this thing, so let me just provide an implicit conversion from string to int, blah. Done. So I, I, I say, well, I need a number. I, I pro provide the string quote one, two, three, and it's a number. So it looks like JavaScript or Ruby or something like that. So you can do the same things. And because it was familiar, people immediately got it. And then they started dreaming and said, oh, I can write super powerful DSLs and things like that. And what happened was a mess. I mean, typically, you get a huge mess. And we have, this, we have really realized that these things, because they are so easy to understand and so powerful, are also very, very dangerous. And people are misusing them a lot. So in the new Scala, we will actually restrict the use of implicit conversions. More specifically, we'll require a special import. So essentially, import language dot implicit conversion to enable these implicit conversions that are not uh, co-defined with the target type. So that means that if I define a new interface and a bunch of conversions from old data to that interface, that was like the intended use case, and that's OK. But if I give you an implicit conversion from string to int, then the compiler will, squeeze, will scream and say, do, do you really need that? And there will become essentially a link to the documentation which says, you shouldn't do this. This is very dangerous, and this sort of thing. So hopefully, it will have an effect. Uh, for this talk, I will ignore them because essentially that, that's been a bit of a dead end and concentrate on what we started with, with implicit parameters. Um, uh, before that, uh, maybe some more, uh, um, more uh, yeah, abstract uh, this discussion of implicits. So when should you use them? So they seem to be very powerful, uh, which is at both Right? and a danger. So implicits basically leverage what the compiler knows about your code and thereby remove repetition and boilerplate. But taken too far, they can hurt readability. So what, what is a good rule when to use them and when, to, when not to use them? So they have actually taken a uh, page from, uh, there was a, uh, an, an interesting blog post from a Rust uh, language ergonomics initiative, which tried to establish some guidelines, which I think is probably as good as anything we have right now. So the guidelines are there essentially three uh, dimensions of implicitness. The first one is applicability. So where are you allowed to rely, elide implicit information? And how do you find out this is happening? So the, essentially the, the more... Uh, the, 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 it, it could be that essentially you, you, you do know that something's missing and it's just not given, or essentially anything can happen anywhere. So that's the, 
the most, uh, the, the, the widest applicability. The second one is power. So what influence does the lighted info have and can it change radically the behavior or types? And the third one is the scope. So how much of the rest of the code do you need to know to find out what's implied? Is there always a clear place to look? And if we look at these three things, then I think they are good guidelines. So the guideline basically is you shouldn't max out all three dimensions. Uh, so it's a trade-off. If you essentially, you trade one for the other, but if you max out all three dimensions, then you have gone too far in your implicitness. Uh, so if you look at, let's say, implicit conversions there, then we have a problem with applicability because we typically don't see that an implicit conversion is implied. It's just two types don't match up, but the types could be inferred. You might not see what is happening here. Uh, the power is probably okay as long as the implicit conversion is well behaved. That means it's functional. It doesn't do crazy stuff like uh, side effects or things like that. Uh, and the scope is again very, very large because essentially you need to find out the whole program from where, where this conversion could have gotten there. Uh, so that's why implicit conversions are actually very problematic because they do tend to max out all these three things. Well, at least one and three. Power depends on what kind of conversions you write. Implicit parameters are somewhat better because for, they are less uh, uh, maxed out in the applicability. To, to say an implicit parameter, I say, well, I call, I'm calling this function. The function has a parameter here. I'm not giving anything. So that's a clear indication. Well, the compiler must have filled in something. So in that sense, they are somewhat better. And in terms of scope, because implicit conversions are basically so super powerful, we now say, well, let's uh, essentially warn the user if the scope is overused. So now we say, well, essentially, oops, sorry. <laughs> At least the implicit conversion has to be, uh, let me go back. That was fast. Okay, has to be uh, uh, codefined with the type it goes to. Okay, so let's go to implicit parameters. So implicit parameters have a surprisingly large and diverse number of use cases, and I want to walk you through, through some of them, what you can do with implicit parameters. In short, we can prove theorems, implement type classes, establish context, set configuration, inject dependencies, model capabilities and several others more. So let me start with something fancy, proving theorems. Um, and um, but, uh, the, the, so the, the problem I want to treat is actually a very simple one. And let, let's say I want to have a method flatten such that if xs is of type list of list of t, then xs of flatten should it be of type list of t. And what it does is essentially it takes all the lists and just concatenates them into one single list. So this is, of course, easy to define if I define flatten as an external method, as a global function. It just goes from list of list of t to list of t. But that's not what I want. I want to put flatten in the class list because I want to write xs.flatten. So it should be in the class list. And then that's, that's a problem because xs.flatten is now in class list of t for arbitrary t, but it's, it can't be applied to arbitrary t. It can only be applied to lists of lists, so it can only work if t equals lists. That's actually a hard problem that merited a, a paper uh, at Uppsala 2004 by uh, Kennedy and Rousseau. That's, uh, you might recognize their names as uh, two of the uh, main persons behind .NET. Uh, they were the people who essentially did the generics in .NET. Uh, they had a paper on how to solve that with a special language extension. It actually turns out that you can do that with implicit parameters quite easily. So here's what you do. Um, you write uh, the class list of A, and then the flatten method, it takes another type parameter B, because, well, it can't, it can't take an A. It can't take a list of A because it only, it only works for lists of lists of A, right? But then I, I say, well, I need evidence that the parameter A is really the same as list of B. So essentially, I, and then I can give you back a list of B. So in other words, flatten gives you back a list of B uh, if A is the same as list of B. So then it goes from list of, list of B to list of B. Cool. OK. So how do we do that? So here we have this thing where we said, well, we have essentially this type constraint. We have to say A must be the same as list of B. 
uh, and in the case of, uh, of Kennedy and Russo, that needed a language extension, essentially a type constraint. But with implicit parameters, we have already everything we need there. So here, here's how we would do this. This equals colon equals is just a trait, an interface, that in here can be written in fix, as all traits are, so with two parameters. And uh, the trait has, we need an implicit instance that matches this parameter, so here is it. It just says A is equal to A. So uh, is equal A, A equals equals to A. And here's the evidence that that is true. Well, I just create a new instance of the trait with an, because the trait doesn't have any methods, I can just uh, create it like that. And that's it. So what you see is it, it's sort of like prolog programming on the type level. I mean, that's what it uh, re resembles uh, because it says, well, here's something, a predicate that you need to establish. And the predicate just becomes a type and uh, the the function that essentially gives you the actual implementation is just an instance of that type. So this form of programming has been known for a long time. It's actually called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. It has been coined in 65, uh, where the Curry-Howard isomorphism says that types are really theorems and programs are really proofs. So Curry-Howard isomorphism is also the thing that underlies a lot of the modern uh, theorem provers like Isabel or Koch. Uh, essentially the things where people prove now the safety of uh, HTTPS stacks and things like that. Uh, uh, and here what we do is essentially is a baby application of the same principle. Yes? So uh, in the D community, this is uh, recognizable as uh, what we define there a constraint template. We'd say flatten is a method under the the, uh, the constraint that uh, A has the shape list of yeah, uh, yeah. list of some B, right? Uh, so that's actually it's, it's a sort of a different uh, way to express the same uh, the the same constraint. So I wonder how you compare the two. Like how do you compare a, const a, a sort of a constraint method that's going to be defined only under the assumption of a specific type shape? Uh, how do you compare that with uh, the uh, implicit well, based approach? So this needs less machinery in the language. So once you've invested to say, well, we have implicit parameters as our mechanism, you don't need this other thing anymore because you can e express it with implicit parameters. Of course, I mean, I can add these things as primitives to the language. I'm arguing that with implicit parameters, I don't need to. Yes? So uh, does this mean through this mechanism we don't need pattern matching on the types? Yes, exactly. That's a very deep, deep uh, realization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, e exactly, yeah. And we, we want to take that one step further to do basically type level computations only with that. So people use it right now, implicit, they use, use it for type level computations, but they do it in a pretty horrible prologue style because that's all they have and we want to sort of liberate it and make it more functional, but that's also future, future work. Okay, so another thing um, that implicits can do is uh, establish context. So uh, for, to here I give you a simple example, a, a conference management system. So let's say you have submitted your talk abstracts to DConf and they are reviewers and there's a rule that the reviewers shouldn't see their own uh, essentially reviews because then maybe your co-reviewer say, well, this is a crappy, pretty crappy proposal and then you're angry at your co-reviewer and you, we, don't, we don't want these situations uh, ha from, uh, to happen. So uh, the, the rule is a reviewer should not see uh, reviews for their own paper. Okay, so how do we model that? Well, we have, let's say we have a scoring function, and we say, well, if uh, uh, the uh, viewers have a conflict with the authors of the paper, or talk abstract, then essentially we blacken out the score, we give a minus 100, and otherwise we give the real score. So that way we, we know that if a, if a re reviewer looks up the score of a paper, they won't see essentially the score of their own paper here. Uh, but of course, that's not good enough because you can uh, find out the score of your paper indirectly, for instance, by viewing the rankings of all papers. So if your paper is at the, at the bottom there, then you might say, well, why was it rated so badly? Uh, uh, but the, then essentially what you do is uh, you also want to essentially um, 
pass the viewers to the score so that uh, essentially if you have, if the paper has a conflict, you give it minus 100 and then your paper will be at the very bottom of the list, but then you know that that's because it was a conflict. Okay, so that's the conflict uh, uh, established context uh, system. Uh, so context here, the set of viewers is usually stable, but it also can change at specific points. So for instance, if I go a little bit further and add a third method called delegate, where I say, well, I have a, a query uh, that uh, essentially uh, uh, to, uh, I ask somebody to have a look at this paper, uh, and uh, I can do that, so with a function, essentially I have a query where I said, well, here are the viewers and give me a T, and I want to ask a person P to do that, then essentially I can run the query with the new viewers, which includes the current viewers and the person. So that's where the context changes. So that's where I say, well, now actually there's one more person that views this paper. Okay, so that's a nice, nice thing way, way, way to do context. So I can, essentially I can pass this down. Uh, configuration and, sorry, oops, I have to. Configuration and dependency management are special cases of context passing. So I'll skip that because it's basically more of the same thing. Uh, the, uh, the last thing here I want to talk about is type classes. So type classes, who knows about type classes, what type classes are? So Right, so very popular in, 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 in languages like Haskell, that's where, where they come from. So a type class is essentially that you can build up operations on a type, not in the type itself, but externally to the type. So a, the prototypical type class is being ordered. So uh, here we have a trait ord of t, so t is a type that is ordered, and uh, being ordered means there's a less than method that takes two elements of a t and gives you back a boolean. Okay, now you can essentially give implicit instances that says, well, ints are ordered because they have a less than method. So that gives me an implicit value that says, whenever you need an order of int, here is it. Uh, you can also say lists are ordered if the element types are ordered. So that's where it, it becomes interesting because that you can't do with normal extension because now we say, well, lists are ordered if the elements are ordered. So that's a form of conditional uh, implementation or extension. Uh, for, with, with implicits, it's really easy. You just say lists are ordered if, uh, so list of t's are ordered if t itself is ordered, and here's the implementation of less for list t, which essentially just looks at the, at the elements and, and, and does the usual lexicographical orderings of lists. Okay, so one thing I've glossed over is here this little uh, point, double colon here, t colon ord, so that means t must be ordered. So what does that mean uh, for a type to be ordered? That's essentially a type class constraint. Well, for us, it just means uh, this. It just means that uh, there is an implicit evidence parameter of type ordered of t. So that's, that's all that, 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 that t colon ord means. Okay, and then I use these evidence parameters in here to actually do the element comparison. Okay, so that's essentially the, the way that implicits can implement type classes, and in fact, uh, when we introduced that first, my first talk about this was poor man's type classes, because it says, well, uh, we already have normal classes, we can't have type classes as well, but we have these little implicit parameters, and they can actually do all that. Okay, good, so, um, right, so we went through that. Okay, so I wanna go back to the context example, sorry. Uh, so that was essentially our latest uh, uh, version here. Uh, and one thing you notice is it, that it's a bit tedious. Everybody has to parameterize this thing with the viewers. So that can like, get, get a bit tedious. And uh, uh, here it might still be okay because uh, there's, there are only three of them, but then it was a, it's a small example for the purposes of demonstrations. If we scale that up to real systems, then it gets much, much worse. So the Scala compiler has the same pattern for a thing called context, literally called context, which contains basically everything the compiler has to know at a certain point with the context, and it's ubiquitous. It means that there are actually more than 2,600 occurrences of this parameter, implicit CTX contexts. And that does get a little bit tedious, so it would really be nice to get rid of them. Can we do that? So let's try how we could, could get there, and that's essentially a new language development in Scala that 
I, I'm very excited about. So if we look at view rankings uh, previously, up here it's, uh, yeah, that one here. So, so that's a def, so it's a function. It takes an implicit parameter, gives me back a list of papers. So another way to write it would be as a def that essentially doesn't take any parameters, but it gives me a closure, a lambda, that now takes the viewers and sorts. So it's just essentially I push the parameters from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, uh, just from a def to a lambda. Yes? It looks weird on the slide. The parentheses don't match. Is that... Uh Sorry? Uh, it, it, it looks like there's a closing parenthesis missing. Out oh, yes, score. sorry. Yeah, there's a closing parenthesis missing. Okay. Well spotted. Thanks. So uh, if we look at this further, so what's its type uh, once we fix in the parenthesis? Otherwise, it would be just a syntax error. Uh, so, so far, the type of this thing was from viewers to list of paper. That's the thing returned here. So essentially, the fact that this thing was implicit got forgotten in the type. And all we're proposing is, let's keep that info in the type. So from now on, the type will be, it's an implicit function from viewers to list of paper. So what does that mean beyond just putting implicit in the type? Well, there are two rules that one has to remember, and they are uh, on the same, same hand simple and also surprisingly powerful. So the first rule is that if you have an implicit function type like this one, then it gets implicitly applied like a method. So essentially, if we have a, uh, a function from A to B and we have an implicit value A in scope, then F it gets expanded to f of a. So we pass the parameter implicitly, just like we would do for a method. And the second rule is that implicit functions get created on demand. So if the expected type of some expression is an implicit function type, and we have uh, an expression of type, uh, let's say it's of type b, then b expands unconditionally to this thing. So essentially, we build a closure that says, well, if we need an implicit function type, then I immediately generate the closure to say, well, let me pass an implicit parameter A here and then put the B uh, in the body of that closure. So that's the two rules. Okay, so let's see how we could uh, change our conference management system with this uh, implicit function type idea. So the beauty about types, why, why am I insisting on types? Well, the beauty about types is I can abstract them, I can name them, I can invent a name for a complicated type and use the name afterwards. So that's what I've done here, up here. I said, viewed of t is the implicit function viewers to t. So a thing is viewed, uh, that means it has an implicit argument viewers, which tells me who views it, and then I give you back a t. So now I have, can drop all the implicit function types, and I just write viewed of int, viewed of list of paper, and so on. So that's basically the, the big uh, savings I have here. I traded essentially the implicit parameters, the repetitive thing, for the types. And again, types are, uh, in our world, good, because essentially they tell you more about the behavior of a program. So trade types for parameters. So that means that by specifying the type of an expression E, we can pro provide a very general way to specify the context for E. If we go back here, so what I have said here, I have the type viewed of int, and that gives me a way to specify the context, essentially what needs to be available for the computation that gives me this type. So that's a new thing. It might seem quite irrelevant but, uh, and, and, and a small thing, but uh, I hope you will see in the, re in the re rest of the talk that it isn't. Okay, so one immediate worry about that is efficiency. Uh, if we do this, uh, this closure thing, then, I mean, closures are objects. Uh, isn't that uh, a complicated uh, uh, operation that costs time and heap, heap memory and so on? So that thing isn't very fast, but actually with the simple rules, the compiler is able to uh, always optimize the function like this back to the implicit parameter. So that's, that's what it does. So essentially what this thing is, is essentially just an intermediate step that uh, essentially the types expand into this thing, but then the compiler will immediately be able to optimize it further. So that means the cost of implicit functions is the same as the cost of implicit parameters, which means it's very, very low normally. Uh, one uh, interesting comparison 
in this uh, area is the, the reader monad. So that's also a somewhat popular method to pass contexts. So that's what people use um, in the more functional world of Scala, uh, where essentially it's monads everywhere. And one monad essentially just does, says, well, if, if you essentially viewers of T would be a thing that can see the viewers and give you back a T, but not as an implicit function type, but as a monadic type. Uh, so if we compare with the reader monad, then implicit functions are a lot more lightweight since they don't force you into monadic style. Monadic style is basically, in Scala, it's all these four expressions with, with the left arrows. In Haskell, it would be do, do, do notation. So basically, it it's, means programming like in a straight jacket with, uh, in a style that resembles actually three address code, so essentially low-level assembly code where essentially you have to name every intermediate result on the left side of the arrow and you can't have if then else or essentially advanced control and recursion becomes problematic, and so on and so on. So it's a very limited style, but essentially with monads, you get forced into that. The second thing is that they compose uh, much better than monads do. So uh, one really nice thing is that with the rules for implicit function types that I've given you, those two types are compatible. So A to B to R and B to A to R are essentially convertible uh, seamlessly. Why? Well, because if uh, I need this, then I say, well, give me a closure that essentially provides implicitly a B and implicitly an A. And then I provide this, so I said, well, okay, I give you an R and I need an A and a B, the compiler says, well, I have, I have a B and an A. I just essentially created that closure. Let me just swap the two and pass it to you. So the compiler does all the rewiring, which in case of monads is a huge, huge worry. You need then to go into monad transformer uh, uh, stacks, and that's typically where the, the high-level categorical acrobatics starts. And furthermore, they're, with the optimizations that the compiler can do, they're much, much faster in our experiments, more than seven times faster than the reader monad. So essentially, you get back the native speed of the underlying platform. OK, so um, the, there's a talk at Popple about a formalization. But I think in the interest of time, I'll skip that here and go to more examples and a wrap up, unless you uh, say, I, I really want to see the formalization. No, OK, let's skip that. That's actually, um, <laughs> yeah, as far as type systems go, this one is pretty, pretty simple, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that one is really two type systems because it shows the A type system and the translation into another one. So uh, for that, it's also pretty much on the simple side. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, so if you want to find out more why it's simple, uh, there's a paper at Popple which is aptly named Simplicitly. Uh, so uh, you just uh, essentially, the talks are online. You can, uh, you can see the talk where I talk about in including the formalization. And uh, the paper is also available. Good. Uh, Let's go to implicit function types again. So I said, well, they can re remove a lot of boilerplate with this uh, uh, viewers and, and in the compiler and so on. Essentially, I can express it as a, as a type, but I needed a parameter. But they can actually do uh, a lot more. Uh, and uh, some other applications, uh, including even algebraic effects, which is sort of another very fancy way to do essentially composable effects uh, that you can do with these things. So here I want to do one other thing, which is uh, maybe uh, known to some of you. So uh, there's a challenge to say, well, can I do re a really nice DSLs like this one here? So I build stuff, let's say I build a table, and the table consists of rows, and the row consists of cells, and I want to write it like that. Can D do that? Yeah? Yeah, sure. OK. Sure, you put it in a token string, then you pass the language, you generate decode from the language, you mix that in, and you got it. OK, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so some, some lang other languages can do that as well, um, with some, uh, something typically special purpose uh, language constructs. So, so examples are Groovy, 
or uh, Kotlin. Kotlin has a thing called receiver functions, which is sort of tailored to that, to that use case, and they're all sort of fairly ad hoc and irregular things. So um, once I, I essentially first wrote, talked about implicit function types, there was Hao Yi, which was a, a big member of Scala community, and he challenged me on Twitter and says, well, I saw this, uh, this uh, nice uh, uh, DSL to build tables. Can you, you say implicit function types are so great, can they do that? And I said, mm, yeah, in fact, they can. So now I'm going to show you how, how, they can, how you can write a DSL like that and it's implicit function types. So if we look at it, if we dissect it here, so what this is is essentially in Scala, these are just essentially functions. And in the braces, that's just an argument to the function. So in Scala, essentially, you can write a block in braces, and it means it becomes an argument to the function that's before it. So it doesn't matter whether you write it in braces or in parents. OK, so we know that that's what they are. And furthermore, the two cells here, that's implicitly, there's an implicit semicolon because they're on two different lines. So clearly, that's a block. So there are two things that happen. And obviously, that must have work with a side effect because, I mean, there's a cell, and after the semicolon, nothing, no, no result survives. So cell must essentially do what it does as a side effect. And the same thing goes for row. OK, so all these things are internally side effecting. So what we imagine what should happen is that a row sort of adds itself to the table that encloses it, and a cell adds itself to the row that encloses it, right? Only how does the cell know what row encloses it, and how does the row know what, what table encloses it? So that's the problem. So that is a problem of context. The cell wants to know the context in which it appears, which is the row, and the row wants to know the context, which is the table. So let's try implicit function types with the context. So here it is. So let's take it from the top. So top a table says, well, I need, uh, essentially, I have a parameter. That is the initializer, and it gives me back unit. So unit is the same as void in D, so it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't return anything. Everything it does is it uh, happens as a side effect. So it should add itself to the table that we're constructing. So how do we know, how does this thing know what table to add itself? Well, we pass it as an implicit parameter. So what we do is, okay, let's create a new table, call in it. It needs an implicit parameter. Here we have the value, so that values will slot in here and return the table. So in it will have added itself to the table. Okay, so row then says, okay, what I need is uh, I uh, uh, need to, uh, the inner row, I have these cells, so that's an operation that needs to know what row they add themselves to, so that's the init. Um, and I uh, essentially call that and call init, so that now the, cell, the, 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 the row is complete. And what, it, what, what does it do as a final operation? Well, it adds itself, so the row that it creates, to the table, to the T. And the T is this implicit parameter here that it essentially uh, gets there. So. OK, and finally, cell uh, is essentially, it just needs to know the row, and it adds itself uh, to that row. So if we now look at what the table example expands to, so that, that's basically what the compiler would have done with it, with all the implicit function types. It would say, OK, table, uh, the argument to a table is an implicit function type, so I immediately build a closure with a compiler-defined name. I'd, called a dollar t, that's just an arbitrary thing that the compiler will set, and it says, well, that's a table. And row, likewise, it needs a computation that needs to know what row it is, an implicit parameter, and that's a row. And then I pass these things down as the parameters, and that, if you then essentially take this expansion and match it up with the implementation, you will find out, yes, that everything adds itself to the, the, the right thing, and I will end up with the table that I've seen here. Okay, so um, to wrap up, uh, yes. Um, perhaps obvious, I don't, I'm not sure. C can I, um, how would you modify the code that you can add a table in, in a row? You want to add a table in a row? Yes. Okay, um, if we go back then uh, my, my table is actually, so I would have to essentially build another builder that uh, does not uh, just return the table as a top-level instance, but in the end I'd have to add essentially 
uh, I, ha I have to do the same thing as for row. It, essentially, I need an implicit function type that gives me the context to which I should add it, and then I have to add it there. But with the example here, I can't do that. I can't add a table. So you'd, you'd overload then the, the first? Yes, yes, I'd need a, I'd need, right, yeah. Okay. yeah I'd need, yeah. I'd need a, an overloaded table. table uh, that would work, yeah, but I have to be specific to what I added because that's the type, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I hope I've shown you that essentially implicits have a lot of surprising uh, and powerful use cases. Uh, some caveat that it's easy to abuse in particular implicit conversions, so uh, that's something that we have learned uh, is, is actually a very sharp sword. And uh, that implicits, for me, are really a very canonical way to abstract over context. So maybe in the future you can see essentially often this pattern to say, well, what I really need is a piece of context here. How do I do this? And uh, I, I believe we, in, in Scala we have, have found a fairly general way to deal with these things. Uh, we're not the only ones, so there has been essentially uh, a bunch of work uh, in this area. Um, so, uh, implicit parameters, like we have them, there's actually a version which is not quite the same thing. It's name-based instead of type-based, but still uh, that predates it in Haskell, Lewis, uh, et al. But since it wasn't integrated with type classes, nobody uses it. So, it is in Haskell. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's actually very little used. There's actually one reason why I believe implicit parameters in Haskell are much less useful than in Scala. It's this thing, try types for terms. So in Scala, the types are explicit. You don't infer them, at least not for, for functions. The parameters and results should be ex explicit. Uh, so in Haskell, the types are inferred. So that, again, pushes it a little bit too far in the implicitness ergonomic scale that you say they're inferred types that I don't even see that essentially synthesize programs for me. That might be a step too far or 10 steps too far. But if the type is explicitly there, then I think it's, a, it's a usual, often a good trade-off to say, well, that's just the tedious task of synthesizing a term. Let's give that to the compiler. Uh, there's a system called modular implicits oops, sorry, in OCaml. Um, that's actually modeled very much after Scala's implicits. Uh, there are ACDA. ACDA is a theorem prover language. They have implicit instances, which is very close to our implicit function types. And uh, further, some, some theoretical works, implicit calculus, and our latest work is called Simplicitly in Popper 2018. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of people that have contributed to not just implicits, but essentially Scala, the various versions of Scala in general, so I put them just up to the slide. And uh, that's it. That's the talk. Thank you for listening. And okay, we, we can make time for a, a couple of questions if anybody has one. No? Oh, there we go, John. So is, is there a case for a runtime equivalent to context setting? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so if we look at the runtime equivalent of this, then uh, the answer, the closest that comes to mind is probably a dynamic uh, scoping or in Java, that would be called a thread local, uh, so that you say essentially it's the it's the parameter in the in the call stack. Uh, so uh, a number of languages have that. Uh, I I'm I'm a fan of essentially uh, compile time because that leads, gives you more a way to actually find out what is happening. In dynamic, it's even worse. So in terms of this essentially ergonomics thing, where you say well, essentially if you trade essentially very powerful code generation. Then if you push that at runtime, that's even worse because it makes it even less tractable what, 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 what goes on. So for me, I, I would personally would stop at compile time. But I mean, if you want to go to runtime, then I think implicit scoping is the closest. So I was um, wondering about the, um, um, the specificity of types that are typically used as implicit. For example, I don't think anybody would say an implicit, uh, would, would uh, write a function with an implicit like string or integer as parameter. So I was wondering uh, how local and you know what, what's the popular use of implicit, what's the popular types, what are the popular types that are used uh, as implicits? 
Right. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of so as, as specific as possible, basically. So that's why in the conference management system, I, I didn't uh, dwell on that point, but essentially the viewers were a, a, a class called viewers that took a parameter which was a set of persons. So the question was, well, why don't you just pass the set of persons directly? And the answer is, well, any set of persons could mean many different things. Here, I wanted uh, an implicit parameter to tell me the viewers of a paper. A set of persons is too general. So generally, I think if you take the analogy to say types are specifications, so essentially they, they express something about the intended effects, then the type of an implicit parameter should be an accurate specification of what you want. So if you say, well, I want the viewers of this paper, then that merits a special type and not just any set of persons. And I think that's a very, very important rule in general. Also, of course, if your types are wide, then uh, you risk more that essentially several people will have used that type and you will then get ambiguity errors in your, comp in, 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 in your system if you maybe add another module because somebody essentially provided another instance for that say, same very wide type. So people learn and to essentially narrow the types, they have very specific types for that. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.